So with your permission, can I start? Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Good evening, everyone. I'm Akash Nayar, and I'm the president of Terex, the Geological Society of Ramlal Anand College. And it gives me and Terex immense amount of pleasure to host Dr. Robert B. Finkelman. I will request all the participants to stay muted during the entire session for the smooth conduction of the webinar. The link for the question form and the feedback form will be provided in the chat box of the Zoom Meet as well as the YouTube live stream. Retired in 2005 after 32 years with the US Geological Survey, Dr. Finkelman is currently a research professor in the Department of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Dallas, a distinguished professor at the China University of Mining and Technology, and an adjunct professor at the China University of Geosciences, Beijing. Dr. Finkelman has degrees in geology, geochemistry, and chemistry, and his professional career has focused on the properties of coal regarding its technological performance, economic byproduct potential, and environmental and health impacts. For the past 23 years, he has devoted his efforts in developing the field of medical geology. Dr. Finkelman is the author of more than 825 publications and has been invited to speak in more than 50 countries. And he was the first person to have written a dissertation on the returned lunar sample. Dr. Finkelman is a fellow of the Geological Society of America and has served as the chairman of the Geological Society of America's Coal Geology Division, chair of the International Association for Cosmochemistry and Geochemistry, working group on geochemistry and health, founding member and past chair of the International Medical Geology Association, president of the Society for Organic Petrology. He is also a member of the American Registry of Pathology Board of Scientific Directors and is past chair of the GSA's Geology and Health Division. Currently, he is a board member of the US section of the Society for Environmental Geochemistry and Health and is on the advisory board of the GeoHealth section of the American Geophysical Union. He was a recipient of the Nininger Meteorite Award, recipient of the Gordon H. Wood Jr. Memorial Award from the AAPG Eastern section, and a recipient of the Carey Award from the GSA's Coal Geology Division. Dr. Finkelman was also awarded a U.S. State Department Embassy Science Fellowship for an assignment in South Africa, and was a member of a National Research Council Committee looking at the future of coal in the U.S. In 2019, he was appointed a Fulbright Specialist for India. As many of you might be aware that Texas, the place from where Dr. Finkelman is going to be delivering the talk, is currently undergoing a power crisis. Many people have lost their jobs, electricity, internet connectivity, and the most unfortunate of all, some have even lost their lives. Rx extends their condolences to the people who are stuck in this power crisis and our heartiest gratitude to Dr. Finkelman for delivering the lecture even in such adverse conditions. Without any further ado, here is Dr. Robert B. Finkelman. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Arkash, and uh, thank you for your uh, concerns about my fellow Texans. Good evening, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to participate in this uh, important event. I want to thank uh, Akash and the organizers for this opportunity. I am going to talk about the prospects of medical geology. And uh, obviously, I'm going to, uh, uh, let me find, uh, here we are. Uh, I'm going to descri describe what medical geology is. Uh, let me make sure. OK. Uh, and I'll provide a number of examples of uh, the medical geology with emphasis on how geoscientists can engage in medical geology research that will help reduce the suffering of their countrymen. So uh, just a brief overview, I'm going to define what medical geology is. I'm going to describe what some of the issues that medical geology embraces. 
and I will talk about an important application of medical geology in India that I am currently engaged in, and then just a, a few concluding remarks. Most of us view the natural environment as being beautiful, as being healthy, as being restful. And for the most part, that's true. But sometimes Mother Nature can be very cruel. There can be danger in the water that we drink, danger in the air that we breathe, danger in the rocks that we come in contact with, and most importantly, danger in the soil that we live on. Every day, we are impacted by the soil beneath our feet. The crops that we grow and eat reflect the chemistry of the soil. The water that we drink has percolated through the soil. The meat, the eggs, the, uh, uh, the milk that we consume are from animals that graze on the soil and eat the soil. And perhaps most importantly, our children play on the soil and either accidentally or intentionally eat the soil. It is the responsibility of the medical geologist to identify when and where these dangers exist. Medical geology is defined as the impacts of geologic materials and geologic processes on plant, animal, and human health. But it's broader than that. We also can use the, our geoscience tools, our databases, our expertise as geoscientists in addressing a wide range of environmental health issues. We can also look at it from this perspective. We're concerned with exposure to dust, to minerals, metals, trace elements, organic compounds, radionuclides, and the geologic processes that act on these materials and bring them into contact with people. Medical geology is closely related, of course, to geology, to public health, to environmental science, and it draws upon these disciplines. But it is a very broad-based sub-discipline. We also call upon information and input from geography, epidemiology, toxicology, pathology, chemistry, biology, social science, economics, climatology, engineering, politics. It is complicated because we are dealing with people. What do, do medical geologists do? Well, <clears throat> primarily, we team, we collaborate with public health biomedical researchers to find solutions for existing medical geology problems. We use geoscience techniques and data to identify potential medical geology problems and bring those to the attention of the public health community. We can help reassure the public when there are no legitimate medical geology issues, but education responsibility. And we investigate the health benefits of geologic materials and geologic processes. And I'll be talking about all of these issues. Medical geology is a relatively new name for an ancient concern. This is Atsi, the Tyrolean Iceman. <clears throat> this uh, uh, mummy was found in Northern Europe, in, uh, uh, in uh, Northern Italy, in the Alps. And when pathologists studied Atsi, <clears throat> dated at 5,500 years, they found soot in his lungs from the biomass fuels that he was burning to 
cool, to warm his house, to cook his food. They found quartz and clay in his lungs uh, from the dust that he was breathing as he walked along what we now call Europe. And in his tissues, they found high levels of arsenic. Atsi, of course, was totally unaware of these environmental insults. And even if he was aware, there was nothing he could do about it. Medical science was in its infancy. Technology was rudimentary. Geology was unheard of. In the intervening 5,500 years, technology has uh, advanced to the point where we've put men on the moon and brought them back to Earth. Medical science is, uh, has accomplished wonders. Geoscience is now a mature science, yet there are billions of people around the world today that suffer from the similar problems to Atsi and even worse problems despite all these advances. But let me acknowledge that many ancient civilizations were aware of this relationship between the natural environment and human health. Also about 5,000 years ago, some of the earliest writings in India documented the use of natural materials, of minerals, uh, to address diseases such as diabetes. They didn't know why, they didn't know what caused these problems, but they recognized that geologic materials could be used to address a range of health problems. Medical geology issues can impact every organ, every tissue in the human body. And I will be discussing a number of these. My primary example will be this study from Guizhou province in China. And there are four important lessons from this example. I will illustrate how widespread geologic medical geology issues are. We'll see that millions of people in this relatively small region suffer from medical geology issues. I will illustrate how serious these problems are. It, medical geology issues have killed thousands of people in this region. We will show you how complex this issue is, how the geology, geologic processes, the culture, the food, the energy resources, the climate, the uh, uh, topography, all play a role in the medical geology issues. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, I'll illustrate that there are relatively simple solutions to these serious and complex medical geology problems. Notice that there are relatively few trees in this region. Uh, the people have long since cut down the trees for fuel, for building their homes, for clearing the land uh, for agricultural purposes. And a hundred years or so ago, they turned to coal. Coal was abundant in the area and it was readily available. So they just randomly used whatever coal was available. And they used the coal to heat their homes in these open fires and to dry the crops that they grew. In the autumn, in the fall, this is a high elevation and a damp area that rains a lot. So to preserve the crops, the chili peppers and corn and uh, tobacco, they had to bring them into the house, hang them from the rafters, and dry them open over these open 
flames. Unfortunately, some of the coal that they were using was enriched in arsenic, and the arsenic caused widespread health problems. The young lady on the left, uh, what looks like freckles, are hyperpigmentation, the earliest symptoms of arsenic poisoning. The gentleman on the right, you see those brown scaly patches on his uh, torso. Uh, this is hyperkeratosis, again, uh, a more advanced symptom of arsenic poisoning. The black mark over his left breast is diet has been diagnosed as Bowen's disease, a precancerous condition caused by arsenic. And we see here in the upper right, hyperkeratosis, uh, extensive uh, keratosis caused by arsenic. The feet, although it's compressed, we see uh, these dark patches, uh, these squamous cell carcinoma. And unfortunately, the example on the lower left is advanced uh, cancer and ultimately led to death. As a geologist, I wondered what could I do to help these people? And I, I was, a, at that time, <clears throat> I was an active coal scientist. So I collected a coal sample and brought it back to my lab at the US Geological Survey, polished the coal and looked at it in the scanning microscope. And this is what we see in this image. And the first thing I noticed were these bright particles scattered throughout the coal sample. These are pyrite, iron, iron disulfide. And in all of the coal samples that I had looked at to that point, when arsenic levels were high, the arsenic was always in the pyrite. Well, this presented two opportunities to uh, remove the pyrite by uh, the pyrite is relatively heavy compared to the coal. So uh, if you separate the uh, density separation, you can remove the pyrite from the coal and thereby remove the arsenic. Also, sometimes the pyrite uh, occurs in large particles and it's uh, commonly referred to as fool's gold, it looks somewhat like gold. We could have told the villagers that if you have a sample of coal in which you can see the pyrite, throw it away, it's dangerous. Well, those are two common sense ways of removing the arsenic from the coal. Unfortunately, if we had made those recommendations, we would have made the problem worse than it already was. You see this gray ghost-like area uh, on both sides of this fracture. When we looked at this area using an energy dispersive detector, we see this on the right, the very bright pink area. That is showing the distribution of arsenic. The arsenic is in the coal. You see here in the lower left, this bulge, the notch, and the pyrite grain in the notch. Well, here on the right is this bulge. There's the notch. There's no indication of arsenic in the pyrite. The arsenic is not in the pyrite in this coal. It is in the coal itself. So we had to come up with a different approach to alert the people to the high arsenic coals. And what we did was develop a simple field test kit. All they had to do was grind the sample of coal, put it in the beaker, add some sulfuric acid, add these pre-measured reagents, and look at the color of the resultant solution. As you see in the lower left, if the color of the solution is dark, that's 
high arsenic and is dangerous. If the color of the solution was light or colorless, that means no arsenic and it was safe to use that coal. And the kit resulted in the closure of a number of mines with high arsenic. People also dried the corn and chili peppers over these fires. And many people used briquettes and the briquettes re ended, resulted in about 10 million people in this region alone with dental fluorosis and 1 million people to 2 million people from uh, suffering from this painful, debilitating skeletal fluorosis. There overall in China, 16 million people suffered from dental fluorosis due to burning high fluorine coal. Now, one, one interesting practice, and this is on the left, a picture of me in uh, 1996, where I was practicing what the local people did. They moistened the coal, they pounded it into a paste, and then they took the uh, soil in the vessel behind me, mixed it in with the coal as a binder. And they used those briquettes every day. They knew exactly how many briquettes they needed to keep their house warm through the night and how many briquettes they needed to cook their dinner. Very efficient way of resource conservation, but it was causing these severe health problems. Do you remember this picture on the right? Uh, the hills in the background are classic karst topography. The underlying rocks are limestones. When those limestones were forming, there was a lot of volcanic activity and volcanic ash settled into the lakes and ponds in which the limestone was forming. When the limestones were raised up and attacked by the rain, uh, dissolved to form those beautiful karst peaks, the volcanic ash, which is typically rich in fluorine, was released. And the soils in this region are high in fluorine. So the soil behind me is enriched in fluorine. And by adding it to the coal, the briquettes were exceptionally high in fluorine. You can see the blue uh, here is one of these briquettes with about 750 parts per million fluorine. That is what's contributing to the dental and skeletal fluorosis. But as geoscientists, we can collect samples, analyze them, and develop a map. On the left-hand side, the red, the coal, uh, there is a lot of coal in the region that is low in fluorine. The brown, again, there are, coal, there are soils that are low in fluorine. Uh, you can see some soils have as much as a thousand parts per million fluorine. So by using our geologic skills, by analyzing the soil and the coal and mapping the area, we could direct people away from the high fluorine coal, the high fluorine soils, and thereby reduce or eliminate this problem. I'll be talking a lot about trace elements and minerals and their impacts on human health. But water, and especially organics in water, can have an impact on the health of tens of thousands of people around the world. This was first noted in the Balkans, in former Yugoslavia, Romania, Bulgaria, where clusters of villages people suffered from kidney disease. We were able to determine that the villages where this disease occurred 
people were drilling their water wells to the nearest aquifer, which happened to be a lignite, a low rank coal you can see in the upper right. As the water percolated through that lignite, it dissolved various organic compounds. If you look at the lower left, the A and B uh, GCMS, uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometer analysis, shows a wide range of organic compounds in the water that the people were drinking. Uh, the lowermost, the C is a control, and you, you can see relatively few organic compounds. The woman on the lower right is, was in your Romania at a dialysis clinic where thousands of people are kept alive by the dialysis treatment. She died about a year after I took this picture from complications from this bulk in endemic nephropathy. When I returned to the United States, I looked at a data on the incidence of deaths from renal pelvic cancers that was associated with this problem. And I found that Louisiana was the highest. Texas was, uh, North Dakota was number two, South Dakota, uh, number four, Texas was number three, Arkansas was number six. So five of the six states that had the highest number of deaths from kidney cancer, all were underlain by lignite. So we collected water samples from the state of Louisiana and W1 and W2 are regions where, which are underlain by lignite. And as you can see, the water people were drinking had a large number of organic compounds, very similar to those that we found in the Balkans. And CW1, CW2 are the control samples and they do not have any organics. In the state that I live in, in Texas, we found the pink area, where, which is the zone of the lignites, that that region had two, two and a half to three times the number of people on dialysis as in the adjacent regions where they were drinking water from other sources. So this seems to be a universal relationship when people are drinking water that's been groundwater, that's been in communication with low rank coals, they suffer a high proportion of kidney disease. So uh, it, there are three states in India that are underlain by lignites. And I think it would be an interesting project to determine whether or not people are drinking groundwater in these regions. And if that groundwater is in communication with lignites, are they suffering a kidney disease in this, these regions, these states in India? Another medical geology problem that affects almost every region in the world is dust, not anthropogenic dust, not industrial dust, but uh, natural dust. As you can see, the dust storms in London, Beijing, Sydney, and in India can impact the health of millions of people. A classic situation occurred in the state of Texas back in the 1930s in what we call the Dust Bowl. The upper left-hand corner, you can see uh, a huge cloud of dust. Well, that has not changed. The lower picture, the same general region, uh, but only a few years ago, another dust storm. These dust storms are more common now with climate change. So this is an issue that is still very much with us. And uh, the dust pneumonia, uh, that term used back in the 30s is really silicosis. 
the uh, effect of having an abundance of clays and quartz in your lungs, much like Atsi had, resulting in a range of health problems. Uh, hundreds of millions of tons of dust is deposited or transported annually uh, from various uh, parts of the world, particularly North Africa. And we see in the lower left, the a dust cloud from North Africa impinging on the Western hemisphere. And in the upper picture, dust from uh, Africa impinging on India. There are two issues. One is simply the burden of dust, uh, the amount of, of minerals that are inhaled, that are res respired by people exposed to this dust. But it's been shown that the dust particles harbor host various microorganisms, as you can see on the right, bacteria, virus, fungus, a very, very important, and some of these I should mention, maybe as much as 10% of these microorganisms are known human pathogens. An interesting research, medical geology research project is why do some minerals host numerous colonies of bacteria and virus and other minerals as you see in the lower part of that picture, repel or even kill the bacteria. Why is that? Uh, we we don't, don't know yet. Medical geology also impacts millions of workers in many countries, including India. Uh, coal workers, construction workers, farmers, uh, factory workers, foundry workers, all of these people are daily exposed to geologic materials, to particulates, to trace elements, to minerals that can and do impact their health. Geologic processes such as earthquakes, landslides, tsunamis, hurricanes uh, can impact human health. People are exposed after these processes to trace elements and minerals and radioactivity that they're not typically exposed to. And this is a, a, an important area of research by medical geologists, understanding the legacy of these natural disasters. What ha happens to the health of people after the incident is history. Animal health is, uh, animals uh, we call this veterinary geology, and it's an important aspect of medical geology because the animals, for the most part, are grazing on the soils, on the crops growing on the soils. And what is in those soils is, uh, taken into their bodies and can have significant impact on the health. And remember uh, that in turn can impact the health of the people. There can be benefits to geologic materials and geologic processes. 2000 years ago, the Greeks used clays called terra sigillata for medicinal purposes. The clays were used to settle upset stomachs, to counteract poisons that might have accidentally or intentionally been uh, taken. Uh, on the right, we see a thousand year old clay tablets used in Turkey. And as you can see, more advanced use. And to this day, we still use some of these same materials that were used a thousand and two thousand years ago to uh, counteract uh, upset stomachs. As a matter of fact, it is believed that Homo habilis, and I, do I have it now, uh, pre-humanoids used clays 
to uh, settle their upset stomachs two million years ago. So as I said earlier, medical geology is not a new field. Uh, it is a newly re-emerging field. One of the most spectacular applications, beneficial applications of plays is for Beruli ulcer. This is a terrible flesh-eating bacteria that attacks people in Africa, in uh, South America, in China, and I believe it does occur in India. Uh, it, it largely is resistant to antibiotics, and in many cases, the only solution is amputation, removing the arm and the leg to prevent it from spreading to the critical organs. But it was found that applying a certain clay to the open wounds will kill the bacteria. And cleaning that off and then applying a different clay encourages the regrowth of the tissue. We don't know why, why these particular clays are so effective. And this is another area uh, that uh, uh, would benefit from the research. Many, many different minerals and other geologic materials are used for medicinal purposes. Toothpaste that we all use contains clays and quartz and rutile. Uh, kaolinite, this or kaopectate, this active ingredient was kaolinite. That's what the Homo habilis was using two million years ago. All these products are dependent on minerals for their active ingredients. And I'm going to go through this very quickly. It's uh, uh, just an abbreviated list of elements, minerals, rocks that are used in pharmaceuticals and healthcare products. Arsenic, mercury, calcium, uh, vitamin supplements, boron, selenium, sulfur, all of these elements are used for beneficial purposes. Uh, minerals, magnesite, uh, barium, bismuth, calcite, rutile, gypsum, talc, all used for health benefits. Kaolin, coal tar, pumice, ro rocks, bauxite, fluorite, halite, zinc oxide, again, all used for medicinal purposes to benefit human health. Now, I've given you an overview of various medical geology issues and their impacts on health of billions of people around the world. So let me look at an issue that is of particular interest to India, the impact of uncontrolled coal fires in the Jharia region of India. Uncontrolled coal fires are not restricted to the Jharia region. The most of the coal fires occur in China, as you see in the lower left. Uh, there are coal fires in South Africa, coal fires in the United States, where I first became interested in this issue. And in, in reality, there are uncontrolled coal fires in every country where coal is being mined. In the 1970s, I started to look at the condensates, the minerals precipitating around the, the smoke that's coming out of this underground coal fire you see in the upper and lower right. And what I found was fascinating. Uh, oh, but let me, excuse me, let me first mention the, the issues. Burning coal beds and stockpiles are significant health hazards. The fires present a physical threat. Heat burns, subsidence, collapse. And these are quotes from the Jaria region. And 
toxic trace elements emissions, as we'll see in just a moment, can cause health problems, as can toxic gas emissions. What I found uh, precipitating uh, around those coal fire events was arsenic minerals, uh, orpiment, amorphous arsenic, realgar, arsenolite, lapamite, and arsenic selenide. Arsenic minerals were the most common, among the most common minerals. Selenium minerals, again, the selenium uh, uh, arsenic selenide, which is a mineral that we named, of downyite, the selenium dioxide. I named this after the student who brought this issue to my attention. Elemental selenium crystals. Uh, selenium minerals were among the most common. Uh, fluorine minerals were also most common. Potassium aluminum fluoride, tin, bismuth, lead. Uh, and if you recall, I'm saying come in, mobilized by these fires was arsenic, fluorine, selenium, the very elements that we talked about earlier as causing skin cancer, causing dental fluorosis, causing skeletal fluorosis. So the, the elements being mobilized by these fires are exceedingly dangerous. But not only the elements, this is some analysis of gases coming out of the fire. Uh, this is from South Africa. And you can see the concentration of benzene, toluene, xylene, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, extraordinarily high, dangerously high, deadly high. In Jaria, that probably for a local region, more fires than anywhere else in the world. And these fires are, are in active coal mines. As you see here, people are still working these mines in spite of these active coal fires. Uh, another example where people are directly exposed to the emissions from these coal fires. Structures are at risk. Uh, buildings are at risk being undermined from these coal fires. And if you look in the upper right, there's a village not very far from these coal fires. They present a threat to, from collapse, uh, children. Uh, here is, you can see the fire beneath a village and uh, the children walking directly above the fire. Uh, this illustrates a, a situation in Jaria where people are burning coal to make coke. Uh, and unfortunately, th this is a major source of income, but the emissions from these fires are dangerous, are potentially deadly and people are exposed to these emissions daily. And again, Jaria, uh, we see the children playing around these fires. We see the underground fires, the smoke coming up through cracks in the ground where the children are playing. Uh, it fire, the smoke goes into their homes where they sleep. A very, very unfortunate situation. A couple of years ago, the, uh, the Jaria region is at number one in the upper right, uh, number of areas where these coal fires occur in India, but the Jaria region is far and away most significant. As you can see, there are quite a few fires recognized in this region. There had been no studies of the health impacts. A few years ago, I arranged for some students from India and one Indian student from the United States to, do, to take a um, questionnaire to two villages, one a mile from active fires, the second village, oops, I'm sorry, 
two or five miles from the active fires. And it was clear that people living closer to the fires were twice as likely to report health problems as people living further away. So we developed a proposal to study these fires. Uh, and uh, this brought me to the Jaria region, uh, to the, uh, my colleagues, uh, Chakrabarti, uh, Sukhalayan Chakrabarti at uh, the Birla Institute of Technology. And I conducted some workshops and lectures. I provided guidance and sampling. And most importantly, we collected samples of coal, of gases, of precipitates uh, that were uh, affected from the village affected by these uncontrolled fires. We visited four regions, four areas in the Donbad region. We had no trouble finding active coal fires, as you see here. Uh, here I am with one of the students from uh, BIT, I'm sorry, uh, BIT Mesra, uh, collecting samples. Uh, this is an extraordinary picture. You see an active burning coal bed. And directly above that is a village. Uh, you can see uh, some of the homes, people living directly above the coal fires. Uh, this is another village we visited. And on the right, uh, you see this trench, very likely uh, constructed to prevent an underground coal fire from undermining the village you could see some of the smoke, the puffs of smoke coming out of that fire. Uh, you can see it more clearly here, people walking by this fire. And behind me when I took this picture was the coal that was being burned to generate coke. And again, the people from the village are constantly exposed to these fires. We found organics bubbling to the surface uh, from these underground coal fires. And we found on the right, uh, well, right and the left, sulfur crystals. Uh, in addition, we found cryptohalite, bararite. Um, these are ammonium fluorides, mascagnite, salammoniac. Uh, bararite, incidentally, was named for a coal mine in the Jaria region a number of years ago. In addition, we found, and uh, this is scanning photomicrographs of these fluorine bearing minerals, but the very bright mineral that you see is an unknown iodine mineral that has, had never been reported previously. Preliminary SEM, energy dispersive and X-ray diffraction analysis indicate huge amounts of fluorine and iodine are being emitted from the coal fires indicated by the widespread and abundant cryptohalite and bararite, as well as several other fluorine bearing phases. Uh, these minerals identified, uh, uh, as I mentioned, and many other unidentified phases that include selenium, lead, mercury, tin, uh, and of course the iodine. We've uh, developed my colleagues at the University of Texas at Dallas and uh, Sukhalayan Chakrabarti and his colleagues uh, in uh, Berlin Institute of Technology and a physician in Donbad developed a joint funding proposal to assess the health impacts of villagers living near these active uncontrolled fires. And the project will include a more systematic sample collection, more comprehensive analytical protocols, and medical evaluation primarily of the children living nearby. So, in conclusion, I want to point out that there are a number of medical geology issues of concern in India. There's the domestic use of biomass, 
of wood, dung, which also creates health problems, uh, not as much as coal, but uh, they have their own concerns. There's natural contamination of well water. Uh, of course, you're all familiar with the arsenic problem in West Bengal, but uh, I wonder about the organics in those states in India uh, where there's lignite, ambient dust, mining, uh, occupational issues, coal, metal mining, the uncontrolled coal fires in a number of different locations of India need to be studied more intensively. The legacy of natural disasters, earthquakes and floods uh, should be studied. A range of occupational health issues, I'm sure impacts the health of many thousands of people in India. The veterinary geology, the health of the animals uh, should be studied and the health benefits, which India has uh, been one of the leaders uh, for the past thousand years or so. There are a number of publications. If you're interested in pursuing medical geology, there are a number of publications that you can refer to. And we have a new book coming out, Practical Aspects of Medical Geology. Some of the, or at least one of these books is from an uh, organization in India where that is focused on medical geology issues. So I encourage you to consider collaborating with the medical community to address a range of health problems that affects many, many millions of people throughout India and bringing your skills as geologists together with the medical community can result in a beautiful picture. I want to thank you for your patience. I hope that uh, you have learned something about medical geology and I hope some of you will consider uh, engaging in this very beneficial field, a field that could benefit the health of many, many people throughout India. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was an incredible talk. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it a lot and had their knowledge enhanced. Good day, sir. I'm Gargi Tripathi, and I will be the moderator for the day. Sir Sanjeev, sir, from the Geological Survey of India sends his regard. He was there in the medical geology training program at the Geological Survey of India in Lucknow in 2006. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Yes, I, I have had the pleasure of visiting India at least three times. Uh, in, uh, I've been to Delhi, I've been to Lucknow, uh, I've been to the Jaria region, uh, and um, I, I've also visited the Taj Mahal, of course, uh, spectacular. Uh, I tell everyone that I've been, I've seen most of the great wonders of the world, but the Taj Mahal was the most impactful. It was the most impressive sight I have ever seen. Well, I look forward to visiting India again when the pandemic concerns have been resolved. We look forward to have uh, to have you in India, sir. We shall now begin with the question answer session, sir. Okay, I am prepared. The first question we have is from Aviral Srivastava from Ramlal Anand College, and he asks, "How can we treat the aquifers which have been affected by lower grade coal?" Uh, that that's a, a good question. And uh, it would be too expensive to treat the aquifer, uh, perhaps too difficult to seek alternative uh, sources of drinking water. So you have to treat the water itself. 
And that's, uh, I have a research project in the United States where we're evaluating uh, filters, uh, various filters, activated charcoal, uh, zeolites, and uh, other materials to see which material would be the most effective in removing the organic compounds. Uh, the well water, if you don't have a faucet, well water can be treated. Uh, there are ways of, you can't filter the organics out, but um, I've been told that sunlight will destroy uh, some of these organic compounds. Uh, the best way though, is to pass the water through these commercial filters that are proven to remove the organic compounds. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question we have is from Mr. Adarsh Kumar from Ramlal Anand College. And he asks, recently there were various reports of a brain eating amoeba in the lakes and ponds in Kerala, a Southern state of India. Is this related to some geologic changes? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware. Uh, I, I don't think so. Uh, although the question is an interesting one. Um, the amoeba itself is not related to the geologic environment as far as I'm aware. And it, it happens, uh, I've read about it in the United States, um, ocean water, uh, lake water. Uh, although it's so rare that I don't think there's been any studies to determine why uh, it, it, uh, it does occur, and is it related to any uh, changes in the environment? So uh, unfortunately, I think it's such a rare occurrence that there simply is no information that would allow us to determine that, to, to answer that question. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question we have is from Kokula from Ramlal Anand College. And he asks, how can groundwater contamination be mitigated where fracking is done? Ah, a very good question. Uh, the, in the United States, I can speak to, to that. Fracking itself does not appear to affect groundwater quality. It's been demonstrated thousands of uh, examples of fracking. The fractures do not extend beyond the targeted bed, uh, shale bed that they're looking at to produce oil or gas. I think in several thousand examples, they found two examples where the fracture extended beyond the targeted bed. The problem that seems to be far more serious is the spilling chemicals at the surface. And uh, uh, these chemicals are quite dangerous, but perhaps the biggest problem is in the well casings, the concrete that's supposed to line the well and prevent leakage, it is supposed to extend beyond the aquifers that overlie the targeted area. And what was found was in some cases, the well casing did not extend through the aquifer. So there was a chance of leakage. And in other cases, in other situations, the uh, concrete casing was defective. There was cracks in it. It was not done properly. And there was leakage through the casing into the aquifer. So the conclusion was that the vast majority 
of the contamination of the aquifer was due to human error rather than to the fracturing of the shale bed that uh, was targeted for oil and gas production. Thank you so much, sir. That was very insightful. The next question we have is from Rahul Bhandari from Ramlal Anand College. And he asks, in this constant fight of economy and human welfare, what should be the way ahead and how can medical geology help us in this endeavor? Uh, these are all good questions. And uh, yes, there is always a constant battle uh, for resources and uh, medical issues, of course, take priority over geologic issues. Uh, let me uh, give you an example. Uh, it was mentioned in the introduction that I uh, was an embassy science fellow in Africa 2004. When I was living there, I met with the head of US aid office in South Africa. And when I, I wanted to talk about all these uh, various health problems, the my health problems of miners, of, uh, uh, well, there's, uh, I could spend an hour or two describing the health problems in Africa, South Africa. And I walked into this man's office and he said, before you say anything, he said, let me tell you what our priorities are. He said, our number one priority is HIV AIDS. Our number two priority, HIV AIDS. Number three, HIV AIDS. Number four, HIV AIDS. Number five, HIV AIDS. In other words, there was no opportunity for me to get any financial support or any other support from him because of the overriding health issues. And this is a reality in South Africa, in the United States, in India, and everywhere else. And that is why I emphasize the practical solutions, that there are ways in which we can come up with clever ideas that will, if not eliminate the problem, will minimize the problem. Uh, the test kit that I showed, mapping uh, to identify areas that are particularly dangerous and bringing this to the attention of uh, the public. In South Africa, there was a beautiful example called Basa Njengo Magogo, where they demonstrated that by lighting the fire of, of a, a, a brazier, a coal fire in a container, if you lit that fire at the top of the coal, rather than the traditional way at the bottom, you would produce less pollution and more energy. And the emphasis really was on the less pollution. So there was a solution that didn't require any effort, didn't require any cost, and it was beneficial both from a health perspective and an economic perspective. So we as geoscientists, uh, in collaboration with our public health colleagues, have to be clever, have to seek out these so simple solutions, these practical solutions. In my opinion is if we can save a single life, it is worth it. We don't have to set that aside to try to find a solution for everyone. One person at a time is, uh, is worth whatever effort is needed. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure uh, the students will make whatever efforts are needed to promote the subject. The next question we have is from Gabriel Matabanite from Universidad Católica del Norte. And he asks, what are the most important aspects of veterinary geology in regards of cattle raising and 
the quality of animal products? The, this the veterinary geology is not my field of specialty. I will uh, suggest that uh, you wait for the publication of our new book, The Practical Aspects of Medical Geology. There is a chapter in there on veterinary geology, and it, um, uh, it describes a lot of uh, important issues that affect animals. Animals are very clever, many animals, uh, many and uh, there are a lot of publications that point out that uh, the animals seek out certain rocks, certain sediments, uh, when they feel the, um, that they're lacking in nutrition. They recognize this and they seek out the rocks that give them that element, that mineral that they sense are lacking. Uh, there is a phenomenon uh, that uh, occurs in India, as well as United States and Africa and China called geophagy. And geophagy is the intentional eating of soil. Where did human beings pick up that habit? They observed the animals. They observed animals that were eating soil to help their upset stomachs, to give them nutrients that they felt they lacked. Uh, so it, it, it's a different situation when you're raising animals. There you have a lot of control. I mean, the animals have little control, uh, but uh, you're feeding them, you're giving them uh, the nutrients that they need. Uh, and it's up to the farmer to recognize uh, when their animals are healthy and uh, or lacking a particular uh, nutrient. But in the wild, the animals recognize this and they address this by seeking out the nutrients that they need. Anyway, I again recommend the chapter in the upcoming book as being authoritative in veterinary geology. Thank you for the question. Thank you so much, sir. I, I hope the participant got what he was uh, looking for. The next question we have is from Rahul Bhandari from Ramlal Anand College. And he asks, how can medical geology help us in urban planning? Ah, <laughs> good question. Um, I've written an article on urban medical geology. It is a misconception that people living in urban areas are immune from the natural environment. Yes, we live in air-conditioned homes. We drive air-conditioned cars, certainly in the West. Uh, our schools are largely air-conditioned. The food that we eat is bought in supermarkets and come from every country in the world. The water that we drink is often bottled water or municipally, municipal water that's been treated. Nevertheless, there are a number of issues that impact urban dwellers and other medical geology issues. The dust storms that I illustrated, uh, the uh, volcanic eruptions, the volcanic gas, uh, 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 tephra, ga uh, dust uh, travels around the world, impacting people all over the world, including in urban areas. Uh, the natural disasters, the floods, the earthquakes affect people in urban areas. The interesting thing is that the urban areas, that's where the political centers are. That's where the economic centers, that's where the educational centers are. That's where the medical centers are. So we 
as geoscientists, as medical geologists, have to educate the politicians, the uh, decision makers uh, in, in every aspect of our society to inform them that the natural environment does impact the health of people in the urban areas. Uh, this is an area that uh, I consider a potential growth area for medical geology. Thank you so much, sir. The next question we have is from Mr. Gokula Krishnan from Ramlal Anand College. And he asks, how can medical geology better the lives of miners and mine workers? Very good question. This is something that I've been working on for a, a long time. For a hundred years, it was assumed that it, I'm talking about coal mining now, that the black lung disease, coal workers' pneumoconiosis, which affects hundreds of thousands of miners around the world, including India, was due to inhaling coal dust. It turns your lungs black. But one thing that we found a few years ago is that there is a very strong extraordinarily strong correlation between the amount of pyrite in the coal and the incidence of coal workers' pneumoconiosis. What happens is when a coal miner inhales a pyrite grain, that pyrite that is respired into the lung in the alveoli, in the sacs in the lung, where the oxygen is exchanged, there's fluid and there's air. The pyrite grain is dissolved and it generates sulfuric acid and ferric iron in your lungs, in the lungs of the miners. It's essentially acid mine drainage in the lungs of the miners. The ferric iron and the sulfuric acid attack the lung tissue and ultimately results in the black lung disease. So what we recommend is that where miners are, or we recommend certainly that miners wear protective gear, protect their uh, you know, masks to protect their nose, their mouth. Uh, but especially if they're mining coal that contains pyrite, that is especially dangerous and extra precautions need to be taken to prevent this disease. Thank you so much, sir. That was really helpful. The next question we have is from Manika Rawal from Ramlal Anand College, University of Delhi. And she asks, what role does transparent play in medical geology? I'm sorry, could you, you repeat that? What? Uh, sure, sir. What role does transparent play in medical geology? Transfer? Transparent. T-R-A-N-S-F-E-R-R-I-N. Transparent. I... I, I am sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with that. No problem. So, so we'll move on to the next question, sir. Uh, the next question is uh, from Sairam from Anna University. And he asks about your insight on remote testing method for the soil, which can be incorporated on some moving platform, thereby avoiding traditional laboratory approach for soil testing? Yeah, we are becoming, we, I mean, the uh, scientific community, the engineers, the remote sensors uh, are becoming very, very proficient in 
testing soils, testing air quality. Uh, I, unfortunately, uh, this is beyond my uh, capabilities to understand how this is done. Uh, but satellite imagery and remote sensing capabilities uh, are growing every day. And uh, combined with geographic information systems, enormous amounts of information can be manipulated to identify uh, areas where there are potential dangers. I have uh, had a student who used satellite imagery to measure particle sizes and other properties of the dust clouds coming out of Africa impinging on islands in the uh, Caribbean. And uh, yeah, uh, without collecting or analyzing uh, the samples, she was able to extract very, very useful information from a range of different satellite uh, images, satellite technology. So this is uh, uh, an important area, a growth area that I think will make tremendous benefits in trying to recognize where and when environmental health problems uh, could be an issue. Uh, and again, that's unfortunate that I, uh, I, I think I'm beyond capable of, of mastering these, uh, this new field, but it is an extremely valuable uh, set of tools that uh, come to play on uh, medical geology issues. Thank you so much, sir. So we have the last question of the day with us. It is by Shreya Adhikari from Ramlal Anand College. And she asks, what effects does medical bioavailability have on the health of the citizens? Uh, good question. And, and, and this is uh, an important point. We are surrounded by rocks and minerals and uh, uh, water and plants. Uh, there are elements in all of these uh, components of the environment. And the question that this raises is, uh, are, do they present a danger? They present a danger to us only if we, if, if uh, these components enter the human body through one of several routes. There are three routes of exposure, ingestion, eating, drinking, inhalation, breathing, and dermal contact, touching, which is uh, the least uh, important of the three. So we have to first determine, it, does that element enter the human body? through eating, drinking, or breathing. Then we need to determine what form that element is. Is that form of the element, is that speciation or the mode of occurrence of the element such that it will be mobilized in the human body? Uh, much of the stuff we eat, uh, food that we ingest is removed, passes through the human body without any harmful impacts. But some of it does uh, it dissolved and mobilized. And then if that's the case, we have to determine whether or not that element will be uh, absorbed into the tissues of the human body and what impact that that will have. So the, yes, we need to know the bioavailability of an element. Uh, classic case, just to give you one example, uh, is lead. If lead, if, if we ingest a lead silicate, it will pass through the human body. If we ingest 
without any harm. If we ingest uh, a lead sulfide, most of it would probably pass through the human body and not impact it. But if we ingest a lead carbonate, that dissolves very quickly. The lead is then uh, bioavailable and could have an impact on a on person's health. Let me give you one final example. Mercury. Mercury is extremely dangerous. It's a neurotoxin. Small, minute amounts of methylmercury can kill you. And yet, for years, I've had mercury in my body without causing any health problems. The mercury was fillings in my teeth, but it was metal uh, amalgam. It was a mercury nickel compound. And as such, the mercury was not bioavailable and did not impact my health. So these are important issues that we must consider knowing the speciation, the form of the element that we're exposed to, and whether or not that element will reach the cells in our body and cause uh, health impacts. So with that uh, really uh, important question, I thank you all for your attention. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure, uh, my honor to uh, be able to talk with this, uh, this group. Thank you. Uh, so we have one more question for you. Okay. Yes. So it is by Mr. Sanjeev Kumar, retired Hello. director, Geological Survey of India, Lucknow. And he asks, the problem of mercury vapor emitting from coal dust dumping and how to tackle the problem because of high mobility nature across physical boundaries. Hmm. Well, that's an interesting question. And uh, again, most of the mercury that occurs in coal is in the sulfide minerals. And I, rather than, uh, well, the mercury, uh, I'm sorry, was, did he, uh, was it coal combustion that he was concerned with? Sir, uh, mercury vapor emitting from coal, dust dumping. Well, the, the problem is a potential problem is the combustion. Uh, when coal is burned, mercury is a highly volatile element and most of the mercury in the coal will be released uh, unless you have these very expensive sophisticated mercury capture technology, which relatively few power plants have, the mercury will be emitted as a gas into the environment. The resulting mercury uh, in, uh, well, the resulting coal byproducts, the fly ash, bottom ash, uh, and, uh, other waste products have relatively little mercury because it's 90% uh, or more has been volatilized. So the problem uh, is not so much the waste products, the ash, it is the vapors coming out from the coal combustion. There's one exception to that, coal cleaning. I don't know how much coal in India is washed or clean, but in the United States, a large portion of our coal is clean to remove the sulfides. The sulfides do have mercury, and if not, uh, and these coal cleaning byproducts are disposed of, are uh, buried. And if they're not handled properly, the sulfides can be dissolved and the mercury can be 
mobilized in the groundwater. But that's a relatively rare situation. Most of the mercury is mobilized during the combustion of the coal. Thank you so much, sir. And this brings us to the end of the question answer session. Okay. Uh, again, I uh, excellent questions. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to address uh, this uh, group. Uh, it's been very stimulating. Thank you. We're grateful to you, sir, that you took out the time to answer all the questions. I'm sure your answers resolved all the queries of the audience and increased the grasp of the, of the subject. It was wonderful to have you help us understand these concepts, sir. A final comment. Uh, you have my email address. It's on the first slide. If I did not get around to answering your questions, feel free to send me an email. Sure, sir. Thank you so much, sir. You're welcome. Good evening. Good evening, sir. As we come to the conclusion of this session, I would like to extend the vote of thanks to Professor Robert Finkelman. On behalf of our team, I, Gargi Tripathi, the Joint Secretary of Terex, express my heartfelt gratitude to our guest speaker, Professor Robert Finkelman, for gracing this occasion with his insights. Today, we had the opportunity to hear your thoughts, and they will definitely encourage us in our future endeavors. Your thoughts have enlightened our minds and introduced us to a novel field of medical geology. Considering the potential that this field has to offer, we are sure that it will bloom and pave the path for, for many researches and opportunities in the near future. Thank you, sir, for adorning the occasion and sharing your knowledge with us today. I now request, uh, sorry, sir. My, my pleasure. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I now request Ms. Manika Rawal to conclude this session with a shlok. Thank you so much, sir, for enlightening us with this new dimension of geology. Uh, so I'm going to conclude this seminar uh, by praising Indian rivers in Sanskrit. So here I go. Janavi Chandri Bhaga Jale Pavitam Bhanu Janar Mada Vichi Bhilalitam Tung Bhadra Vipashadi Bhir Bhavitam Bhutali Bhati Me Naritam Bharatam Meaning, by the water of Ganga and Chenab rivers, by the waves of Yamuna and Narmada river, echoed by Vipasha and Tungabhadra rivers, my sacred country glows in the surface of earth. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to request Aviral to uh, carry on with the vote of thanks and conclude the Vashang 2021. Hello, everyone. As our two-day event, Vashang 21 is coming to an end, I, Aviral Shrivastav, Vice President of TEDx, would like to thank all the driving forces behind it. Firstly, I will thank Dr. Rakesh Gupta, the principal of Ramlalanand College, for allowing us to conduct the event and supporting us no matter what. I will also like to thank the faculty, Dr. Prabhas Pandey, Dr. Sarbari Nag, Dr. Ravish Lal, and Ms. Lemmy Onzimik for their constant support and their invaluable time. I will thank Akash Nair, president of TEDx, who, without whose guide, guidance, the event wouldn't have been possible. All the heads and volunteers uh, worked hard to make this event a grand success. Lastly, I would like to thank all the participants for enthusiastically participating in our event. The event got its charm from all the informative talks by the prestigious dignitaries, Professor Morrissey Tucker, Professor Nigel Hughes, Professor Ashok Sani, and Dr. Ro Robert Finkelman who helped us discover interesting and innovative ways to look at the subject. Thank you for being such a wonderful audience and we will be hosting much more events like these. So stay tuned. As the vice president of the society, I declare Vashang 21 officially closed. Sir, uh, also, I would like to uh, say something. Uh, as you were saying that you are planning to visit India in the near future or in the future, 
you are most welcome to visit our department and uh, it will be a great honor to host you sir thank you i hope uh, we will be able to travel and interact uh, sooner than later and i will certainly uh, consider your kind offer thank you so much sir thank you Well, let me again emphasize that if there are any questions concerning medical geology, please do not hesitate to send me an email and I will certainly respond. It's been a, a great pleasure. I thank you all for your attention and uh, perhaps <clears throat> One day in the not too distant future, I'll be visiting uh, Delhi and uh, your university. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Now I will request the participants to leave the meet. And sir, I will I'd like to thank you again because I personally did not know anything about medical geology until unless I came to know about you giving a webinar for our society and it was enlightening to say the least. It uh, has intrigued me to some other level and I will be looking into it for sure in, as a as something I want to pursue because it has direct impact with the people I interact with and uh, Mother Nature and Earth. Thank you so much. Bye, sir. Thank you so much.